What's up guys, Nick Howell here coming to you live from Barcelona at VMware Explorer 2022 here in EMEA. Uh, and I got a surprise for you today. A couple of weeks ago, I, uh, we did a little new Data Center Dude Presents here on the channel. And uh, I'm very excited to have, joining the Data Center Dude here in Barcelona, the Data Center Brit. Jason, come join me, man. Thanks for, uh, for being here for a video. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation with you because we're at an interesting crossroads. If you look at uh, where things have come from with, with VMware, it's interesting to see where they are today. So what is it that we wanted to talk about today? Well, today I think we should really cover what's the future of VMware. So we've had a couple of decades now where we had a big revolution when virtualization first started, right? And there's been evolution in between. And there's been a couple of other revolutionary moments um, in other spaces, but not, not so much in virtualization. So containers and Kubernetes, I think that's a bit of a revolution as well. The standpoint of virtualization itself, since that revolution, there's been kind of a lot of iteration. Um, yeah, more of an evolution than yeah, revolution. It, absolutely, right, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and I want to, we're, we're back to in-person conferences, right? This is our second VMware Explore. We did the US, we're now doing, doing EU. And I think it's time to talk about what's the future hold. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I always say to know where you're going, you got to know where you came from. And I, I think there's a lot of new, one of the takeaways for us this week has been, there's a lot of new faces. Yeah. Um, so for those that have not worked with VMware more than what, the last five years? Like there was a time where VMware was a tiny little fledgling company in the early 2000s and they were bought by this megalith known as EMC, right? And EMC really just launched them into existence and that's how we got the VMware movement of the late 2000s. And that led into all of this other stuff that uh, the acquisition in 2016 of Dell of EMC, which also brought along VMware. And now VMware has broken out as of last year, I believe. Uh, and they are now back on their own independent uh, away from Dell EMC. Well, it wasn't too long. I don't even think it was a year no, no. that there was an announcement made that Broadcom were to acquire, announced their intention to acquire, and we now know it's moved forward since then, uh, of acquiring VMware. So we all kind of went, whoa, why is this legacy company playing with our v beloved VMware? Well, now that we think about things that are happening, it starts to make a little bit of sense. So as you and I have talked throughout the week and over, frankly over the last couple of weeks, it's become really clear to me that there's some things I wasn't thinking of when it comes to the marriage of VMware and Broadcom. What are some of those things that are top of mind for you? Right, okay, so first of all, I want to say like Broadcom, absolutely massive company, yeah. right? I mean, probably, larger than people think. So they have a software division, but they've got a hardware division as well. And so they ship a lot of switches. The Tomahawk series of um, chips for switches are really, really impressive. It's something that I, I often take for granted. All of the chips for Raspberry Pis, that's all come out of Broadcom. So they have a, they have a huge hardware perspective to add to the, the software business, right? right. And we're, we're kind of on the cusp of a hardware revolution. There's so much going on. In the, like what, for example? Okay, so the move from x86 to ARM, to oh, yeah. ARCH64, right? So kind and just of, SOC chip design in general, Yeah, right? SOC chip design is huge as well, right? So, so and DPUs, right? So um, the NVIDIA have a project for that. There's a number of others. We've seen a lot of startups in the DPU space. We've seen a lot of different things in offload technology in general. So we, we started back in, you know, probably a decade or so ago with um, TCP offload engines on, on Nix, but like this has expanded. And as, as the rise of ARM architecture has changed, that's added more and more um, of the offload engines out there. But we're also seeing some really nice uh, advancements in technology. So the Compute Express Link. Um, now, a lot of people think of that as a little bit of a sort of replacement to Optane, but it's more than that. Compute Express Link allows us to build effectively fabrics and rack scale compute and memory. That's that's a really wow. interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting. Especially when you layer uh, via technology such as ESX on top of that, and then an additional layer of management with vCenter and all of the auxiliary components, it starts to make your head turn a little bit, and you go, "Hmm, okay, I see where this is going." So, how do you see all of that stuff that you were just talking about really apply to a VMware end user? What have what have they got to look forward to that that they haven't gotten in the last ten to fifteen years since VMware really became mainstream? So. There's a couple of things that I think Broadcom could do, right? I think they could marry up the hardware business with, with the software business. A la Apple? Yeah, pretty much, right? So okay. what, what if we had, you know, straight up virtualization in firmware or, or, or as an extension of the chip design, the SOC design? So, you know, virtualization on switches. Um, maybe you could, because 
you got to think about distributed computing is a big thing now. Yeah. Um, the edge is taking off. IoT is huge. Uh, you know, if I had some form, even if it was cut down, some form of ESX on a Raspberry Pi where I could just do some native functions at the edge where I could do it in a switch, where maybe, you know, I need a branch office switch or I need something there, but I don't really need much more. But there's a lot of power in modern processors and right. a lot of memory in these things. Maybe I just need a small subset of VMs or containers that I could run in an embedded device. I've right. got one for you. Yep. What if you could take and put an ESX host on a PCIe 5 Gen 5 card and then start slotting that into you know, mega servers, you know, it goes yeah. back to some of the principles of blade chassis from it 10 does, plus years does, ago, yeah. but now we've got PCIe Gen 5 and crazy bandwidth direct to memory and CPU. That starts opening the door to more, we hear the phrase fungible infrastructure from time to time, right? And I start thinking about like replaceable components like that as replacing entire ESX hosts. That takes scale to a whole different conversation. Yeah. And I think things, so that kind of fits hand in hand with what I was saying about like CXL. So Compute Express Link um, is a way to build fabrics yeah. of, of CPUs, memory, and, and give direct access. There's also some other interesting technology things that are kind of in infancy, but they're, they're coming along. So there is silicon photonics, which is the idea of being able to terminate um, communications devices at the silicon. So rather than having transceivers, and there's a way of, interesting. you know, at the most extreme example, it would be, you know, you terminate a fiber into a CPU wow. die. Um, well, it cuts down on latency and the PCI bus and other things that come out. So as we expand on networking technologies, we get towards 400 gig, like the distances that we can do, we get shorter. You know, we're only talking about a couple of meters of cables. If you can take away 50 centimeter of the connectivity within the, the bus itself, you know, those on the, the board, um, that's, that's valuable space you can save. Totally. Absolutely. So, I, like I said, I think there's this hardware revolution, right? And I think there's a way that we can tap in this software into that hardware revolution that also fits into the bigger mainstream markets that we're seeing. So AI, ML is a big market, Edge IoT, big market, telecoms are expanding massively. And so, you know, and we've, we've found from our journey through the cloud and containers that there isn't one size fits all. Applications are still diverse. People still run virtual machines. They, they run containers, they run cloud native apps, they run functions. But the, I think that mix isn't going away. There's a yeah. lot of future there for um, a, a kind of heterogeneous environment. And that means that the future of VMware is pretty bright. Now, something we've talked about, how do you manage it all? Oh, That's good point. That's a big question, yeah. right? I think the thing I'm really excited about is where does vCenter go from here? Because we've certainly got mission control with Tanzu. We've got some of the, we heard about Project North Star this week. That could be some interesting things to do within SX and the way that you're doing WAN networking uh, and really some of that bigger mesh networking stuff you would do with your cloud providers. But I start looking at, okay, how do you manage VMware? One of the things that sold them, nobody will ever go back to managing an individual ESX host after the first time they've used, used vCenter, right? So how do we go back to that point where, um, now that they've blown all of these additional products out, how do we bring them all back in together? And then how do we begin layering in other external resources, kind of like the NetApp VSC or like plugins, right? We had the plugin architecture for vCenter 10, 10 or so years ago. That's still there today, but it's different. The architecture for the plugins is different. I think there's an opportunity to build like third party resource providers of some sort that allow vCenter to manage other pieces and components of infrastructure externally. APIs have taken over the world. There's really no reason that vCenter can't become just like one central universal orchestration engine uh, to do a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because I think one of the things that we're crying out for, the clouds are great and the clouds have revolutionized control plane. Um, and I, I think there might be something in the future that we can talk about around sovereign data centers and, and how, you know, the evolution of cloud control plane might happen. But I think VMware have got a play there. And obviously yeah. we're from NAP. I've got a I've got a big chance that we have a play there too. We right? absolutely do. We you just know, announced it at Insight. It's called right. Blue XP, so go check it out. So these uni people are crying out for these universal control planes. Things yeah. that, because I'd, I'd have to put workloads in different places. I, I still have to do some on-prem. The, the economics are there or the, the locations are there for on-prem or edge. So I still have to do those. The cloud is a great place to go for elasticity, for yeah. speed. Um, for, for many of the features they offer, but but there's going to be a broad set. Yeah. And so that universal control, control plane that allows me to pick the locations, to pick the technologies, to plug it all together, I think that's a really big market coming forward. Or even better, take it one step further, build policies around where data is allowed to live and then report on the compliance 
of that policy. Exactly. Like the, to get into sovereignty, you're having a completely different data classification conversation. I think, like you said, we want to have that because we've been talking all week about where data centers go and things like that. How do we deal with sovereignty? How do we deal with compliance and governance and all of those big words that we have to deal with in IT. So uh, Jason, thanks so much for, uh, for joining me here this week. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've shot a lot of content. We've got a lot of stuff coming you guys' way. So stay tuned, make sure you hit that subscribe button, little bell, all the things you guys know how to do. And uh, thanks for joining us. See you next time.